Pick a color. Red, green, or blue? Purple. Blue. Blue. Blue? Okay. So, um, I actually already have these built. We can change the code right now and I can show you how that looks. But this is the code for the program that is currently running on there. Um, so, this number here indicates which pin in port F is toggling. So, pin 1 is red, pin 2 is blue, and pin 3 is green. So, this is the code for making the green LED blink. So, if I replace this 3 with a 2, it should do blue. And so now I change the code, and now I'll back out and I'll compile it. It's compiled. And now I have this main.bin thing. That's the binary for the program that we're going to put on it. And now I'll use the handy dandy bootloader script. So if I run uh, sudo bootload, or actually, first I have to connect to it. So let's do uh, new man manager. So it's right there, bootloader. Good. And now we're connected. It's on RF com 7. I look over here and I say sudo bootload slash dev RF com 7. The baud rate is 15200. And the program is main.bin. And go ahead and hit that reset button. Now watch what happens on the screen. And wirelessly program that microcontroller. We're going to figure out how to do that today. All right, so um, let's just jump right into the presentation. I need to get the screen recording started, so I'm going to do that right now. So, and then we'll go ahead and uh, get rolling here. to do the upload to the device. So um, 
once you have this, you should be able to run the included um, bootloader.py script. So if you unzip that, that zip archive, um, the bootloaders.zip archive, inside of the bootloader.py script, you should be able to run that script with no arguments, and it should just spit out a usage, uh, a usage line. And if it does that, then you're good to go. If it tells you that you're missing pi serial or something like that, then you need to install it. Um, and there are instructions on the Facebook page for that. Okay, so does anybody not have this link? All right. Okay, so let's do a quick overview. Um, what are we trying to do here, and why is it important? So we'll look at some motivating examples for, for why we're trying to understand how to do bootloading. Um, then we'll go over some definitions of some terms that we'll be hearing throughout the presentation. We'll look at file formats. Specifically, we're going to differentiate between binary file formats and text file formats, and this is sort of like leads you into understanding how um, program data is represented. Then we'll talk about communication systems. Specifically, we'll talk about UART, which is the, the mechanism that I'm using to talk to that board in the back there. Um, we'll look at the memory model for the device that we're working with today. We'll do a quick recap of the ARM registers stack execution and instructions. Um, this is something that was brought up in previous workshops, specifically in the context switching workshop. So I'll use the same examples that I used there to illustrate this. Um, and then we'll look at the program startup procedure, so how we actually, how, like, how a program actually boots on one of these devices. And then we'll take a look at linker scripts, which are scripts that allow us to configure the behavior of this tool called the linker, which is used to place parts of our program into memory of our device. Finally, we'll take a look at programming the flash, and then I have some additional resources for you. And in that zip archive that you all should have gotten is the code for this project, um, and then we'll go ahead and get started on the project and give you some pointers. Um, and there's some extra credit stuff you can do too, if you're interested. Okay, so any questions about this? All right. So, let's suppose you're building a satellite, okay? And where do satellites go? Space. So, it's going to space, right? And what can you not do to the satellite once it goes into space? You can't touch it, right? You can't exactly, you know, plug a cable into it once it's up there, right? Like, there's no way to do that. Um, so, what are you going to do if the satellite stops working? Like, you know, all of a sudden one of its attitude thrusters starts firing uncontrollably and it just goes whizzing off to the distance. Right? You're kind of in a pickle, right? So, <laughs> so what are you going to do? So we need some way to load new code onto the satellite, and then we need to boot that code. So can anybody guess what we need? A bootloader! Boot Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I had a lot of fun with animations. <laughs> All right, anyway, um, so we need a bootloader, okay? So that, that's really what it is. A bootloader is a loader for things that boot. So load means take something and put it somewhere else. So we're taking a program that's not currently on our computer, and we're putting it on our computer. And then boot means that we're running that program, okay? So the computer is currently running some program, we want to put a different program on it and run that program, okay? So that's what a bootloader does. It's a, kind of like a meta program. It's a program that manages other programs. So let's do another example. You're doing that car, okay? And you want to change your algorithm. You don't just want to do live tuning, okay? Because a lot of teams now have Bluetooth terminals on their, on their car and they can you know, adjust coefficients and things, right? That's, that's an example of live tuning and you can you know, monitor what the car is doing and, and change its coefficients. But what if you actually want to change the way that the car behaves, okay? Not just change the PID coefficients. You want to actually make it respond differently to the stimuli, okay? You want to be able to replace the part of the program that controls how the car behaves, right? So how do we achieve this? Well, we'll give you a hint. It's the same way we, we would do before. We use the bootloader. Um, and do we actually need to change the entire program? Any ideas? Like, like, what actually needs to be changed? If we want to change the behavior of the car, there's a lot of code on there, right? There's code that handles the camera, there's code that handles the motors, there's code that handles your terminal if you have one. Like, there's all kinds of things that are running around inside this, this, this program, right? So what parts do we actually need to change if we want it to behave differently, right? So I'll leave this to you to think about. Um, so does the code that runs the server need to be changed? Probably not, right? We probably just need to change the code that, that runs the control loop. Um, and is it possible to change just that control code? And the answer is yes. Um, but we have to do some clever engineering first in order to make that work. And we'll talk about that a little later. Okay, 
So let's go over some definitions. A program. So a program is a piece of code, more or less independent of other code on your computer that does something, that runs on a machine, generally you know, like a, an electronic computer of some kind. Um, and I say more or less independent because programs can very often share functionality, they can communicate with one another, they can do all kinds of complicated things with other programs. So programs don't always exist in a vacuum. Right? And a bootloader is an example of a program that certainly does not exist in the vacuum. It's, it's used to modify other programs. Okay? So um, that is a program. So is the thing that the bootloader loads. That's also a program. So um, it's a pretty, pretty broad definition here. Boot okay, is the process of a computer starting up. And generally, we talk about booting in the presence of an operating system. Okay? So like Windows boots, or Linux boots, or Mac OS X boots. But other things can boot too. And a bootloader, it can be thought of as a very simple operating system. It basically has one primary function, and that is to load other programs. It doesn't do a lot of stuff that other operating systems would do, you know, like protect your memory and allocate resources and stuff like that. But it does, in a sense, behave similarly to, uh, or it has features that are similar to the features that are found in operating systems. And a bootloader, like I mentioned, is a software component or a program that is responsible for putting other programs in memory and then running them. Okay. So now we get some vocabulary from last time. An interrupt. So an interrupt is an event, whether that's internal or external, that causes the processor to stop doing what it's currently doing and start doing something else. Okay. So you guys, how many of you have taken CS thirty or uh, thirty-three? And what about one eleven? Okay. All right. So I think that. Is this session on 33? I don't remember. Uh, I know this yeah, session on 11. Ryan did talk about it. Okay. It's definitely talked about it more about it. Yeah, so, so have you guys heard the word interrupt before? All right, cool. Yeah. So, so basically, it's any, any kind of event that is, that is available in the hardware to cause this to happen. Specifically, the processor is doing something, and we stop it, and does something else. Now, we're not actually going to look at interrupts this time. We're only concerned about this because of something called um, interrupt search routines, and also the interrupt vector, and then the interrupt vector table. So we're really concerned about the interrupt vector table, because this is something that exists in some of our memory that we have to take care of when we're doing bootloading. But um, an interrupt generally triggers or fires an interrupt service routine, which is some piece of code that runs when an interrupt occurs, or we call it like when an interrupt arrives or when it fires. This piece of code runs. It's generally a function of some kind. So you might have, say, like a button. Okay, when you press that button, an interrupt fires, and that interrupt causes an LED to turn on, or something like that. Right? And there's some, there's some snippet of code inside the machine that gets triggered when we press the button. And that's called the interrupt service routine. There's also an interrupt vector. Okay? The interrupt vector is, you can think of it like a vector, like, a, like a, an arrow. It's an arrow that points to the thing that should run. So there's a table, the interrupt vector table, which stores all of the vectors for all the interrupts on your system. And you might have multiple things that can trigger interrupts, and they'll all have an associated vector which points to the associated function that's going to run when that interrupt occurs. Okay? So what we're really concerned about is the table. All right? um, so we call it an interrupt vector table, or an IVT, or a V table. And it's just an array, like constant array. You, know, you guys know about arrays in memory. So it's just an array of constant pointers that refer to um, ISRs. And we use this table to look up the appropriate interrupt, sorry, the appropriate ISR for a given interrupt. Right? Okay. And finally, human readable. Any information capable of being understood readily by a human, which is dubious because, I mean, what I can understand readily and what Stephen Hawking can understand readily are two completely different things. And I'm sure that you guys probably feel the same way. So um, not, not everything is human readable. I'm going to use this term to refer to the difference between binary and plain text files. But to people who breathe machine code, you could consider any binary file human readable. But not really. OK. All right. So um, any questions about, about this stuff? Is that pretty straightforward? Am I losing anyone? Like, I, I don't want to get, get really far ahead and then have to move understand something. Yeah? Have you ever talked about other traps? So we talked about traps in the last workshop. Um, they're not really necessary to understand here. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, we're actually we don't even have to touch interrupts at all. The only thing that we're concerned about is the table because we have to do something special with the table. But other than that, we don't have to worry about that. Okay. Any other questions? 
Right. Oh, also, um, you should all get a kit. I did, did distribute those. Um, so, uh, great. Would you have this? Um, you need to collect collateral in the form of an ID for these. Um, and then he tracks it in the yeah. pretty sure. Okay. Yeah. So um, you can all get one of these kits. Inside, you should find a uh, board, little red board, just the one that's back there, and USB cable. And um, if you follow the setup procedure on the website that was on the Facebook page, um, you should have installed the drivers and stuff for it. You should be able to upload code. Um, so if you ever used Arduino before, if you open an Ergia and go to the examples and then go to like Blink and you load the Blink program, if the LED actually blinks, then you're good to go for the rest of the workshop. If it doesn't, then I'll have to come around and help you. Um, so we'll save that for later. But let's move on to the definitions. All right, a compiler. So you guys have all heard this word before, but maybe it doesn't mean to you what it means to me. Um, so hopefully I can uh, clear that up. So a compiler is a piece of software that takes a program that's written in a high-level language. Okay, and high-level is a very, it's a very nebulous term. It can mean a lot of things. In this case, we're referring to languages like C, C++, Python, that sort of thing. Like so, around that level of abstraction. Okay, and we're taking that that high-level language and we're converting it into a low-level language. And in this case, we're referring to assembly. And assembly is just one step above machine code, which is the actual the actual binary bits that run on your hardware. Okay. Preprocessor. A preprocessor is a piece of software that makes substitutions for macros. Okay? So if you guys have ever seen this in your code before, pound define. This is a macro. So the C compiler actually never sees this. Right? This goes to the preprocessor and it's textually substituted. So you might say like pound define pi 3.14 or whatever. And what the preprocessor will do is before the compiler ever touches this code, it's going to go through your code, it's going to find every occurrence of the letters pi. And it's going to replace them with 3.14. Right? So that's what the preprocessor does. And macros are actually a language in their own right. Okay? And they can be sufficiently complicated. Uh, but that's a little bit of a tangent. A translation unit is a program source file after being processed by the preprocessor ready to be compiled. Okay? So it's had all of its macros substituted. And it's ready to go through the compiler. And we call it a translation unit because this is a the smallest piece of translation, namely the process of converting from a high-level language to a low-level language, that we can have. All right, so it's a single program source file. So that might be like a single C file, a single .cd file, or maybe a single Objective-C file if you're an Apple person or whatever. Um, and that goes to the compiler, and you get out what's called an object file. Okay. And an object file is the result of compiling a single translation unit. Very uh, uh, topological there. But basically, an object file contains a bunch of symbols. All right? And symbols are names for program objects. Now, this might be kind of confusing. I'm using the word object again. But what I mean is a function, a variable, a vector, whatever. Like all of these little bits and pieces that are inside of your program. They're associated with symbols, and the symbols let the programmer and the compiler and the assembler and all the other parts of the tool chain refer to them by the same name. Okay? And so, for example, when you define a variable, you might say like int foo, right? Foo is a symbol. It refers to a location of memory that may not have necessarily been determined yet. You might not actually know where it is yet when you get to object file stage. In fact, you probably don't. Object files are relocatable. So there's a name that refers to some place in memory. You're not really sure where that place of memory is yet, but you can agree with all the other programs, and you yourself as the programmer, you can agree that it's called foo. Okay? And so when, whenever, everybody, whenever anybody in this process says foo, they mean that thing that you declared foo. Okay? And that's what a symbol is. The linker is a piece of software that resolves references to these symbols. So if I have two pieces of code, this piece of code over here defines the symbol foo, and this piece of code over here refers to foo, I can compile them separately because they're both translation units. I can translate them both to assembly, to object files. And this one refers to this one. And what happens is that they both go through the linker, and the linker says, oh, this guy is talking about something that's defined over here. So when I put these two together, this is going to refer to this. And it basically reconciles all those references. Okay? So we haven't actually, like, before the linker, we're not at an executable yet. We can't, we can't put that code on the machine and run it yet. We have to first link it to resolve all those references. 
So an object file could potentially have un un undefined references. And that's what, that's what happens when you see that funny error in your compilation process that's like undefined symbol, blah, blah, blah. That's because the linker couldn't find the thing that that refers to, all right? And so what you have to do is figure out why that didn't work. Now, um, the symbols don't just come from your code. They can also come from other places. And specifically, we're interested in when they come from the linker script. And we'll look at that um, towards the end. All right. So a library is a collection of program functionality labeled by symbols. So this could be functions, variables, whatever, all rolled into a big blob, all right? And this is called a library, and you can link against it. So we say linking against. What we mean is that we're taking some program that we've written, and we're saying that the things, the undefined references in this program refer to things in this library. So we're linking our program against the library to resolve those references, okay? And so we often use libraries to provide common functionality. So you guys might have heard of something called libc. Libc is the C runtime library. So all of your C functions like printf, malloc, stir copy, all those functions like that, those are all defined in a library <coughs> called libc. And every program on your system that uses C, the C runtime, refers to that library. So if you change that library, you update everybody. Okay? So that, that's what's really cool about this, is you can basically modularize your program. And there's a difference between like dynamic and static linking, but we're not really concerned about that right now because everything on this device is going to be statically linked. Um, okay, so yeah, the runtime and math and math libraries are examples of, of this. The assembler is this is a piece of software that then does the final step. It takes those assembly files and converts them into machine code, which is actually what's going to run on your processor. Okay. Any questions about this stuff? All right, cool. Memory. Memory is any device that can be used to store state or information across units of time, okay? So you guys remember from like from <coughs> M51A or, or uh, M16, uh, you have like a register, right? Register is like the, the, the atomic unit of memory. So our flip-flop, for example, one bit, okay? That's state, meaning something that is persistent in time, okay? So we have memory in our computer that's used to store intermediate computations while we're doing stuff, okay? And there are different kinds of memory. So we can refer to memory by its access permissions. So we can say it's read-only or write-only, or maybe it's execute-only. And what that means is that we're only allowed to read, only allowed to write, only allowed to execute, whatever. And these permissions are often dependent upon the actual capabilities of the hardware and if the hardware is capable of multiple permissions, then it's dependent upon some configuration of the operating system or whatever piece of code is running might do. So, for example, if you have a program you want to protect something, you want to say, my program does something secret, and I don't want anybody else to know what it is, you can mark the memory that contains the procedure that does that secret thing, read only, or uh, sorry, execute only, which means that nobody can read it. You can only ever execute that code. So nobody can you know, attach a debugger and look inside and say, oh, I know what this weird thing is. Um, and this, this can also be due to hardware limitations. For example, you might have a ROM, a read-only memory. So this is often used for shared libraries that are burned into the hardware. So for example, on our device, we have a shared library which provides functions for doing things like controlling the pins, like turning LEDs on and off and stuff like that. And those functions are shared among all programs, and they never change. So they're stored in ROM. They're actually burned into the silicon of the device. You can't change them. You can't write them. So they're read-only. <coughs> volatile is another term we use to refer to memory. Volatile means that the memory does not persist its, its contents when we turn off the power. So RAM is an example of a volatile memory. Okay? So in your computer, you have a bunch of stuff that's running, right? And those things that are running, they make state. They store variables and update state and whatever. That generally happens in the RAM because RAM can be very, very quickly written. And it can, it can be written many, 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 many times before it breaks. So we use that to store our intermediate computations. But one of the downsides of RAM is that it's volatile. So when I turn the power off on my computer, whatever's in the RAM goes away. Now, it doesn't all go away. And this is actually um, one of the reasons why you can exploit this and actually you can actually break the security of systems by inspecting the memory when you turn the computer back on. 
because it doesn't it doesn't actually clear all of it. It mostly just clears a lot of it. But yeah, the idea is that RAM is volatile, so if we turn the power off, the state goes away. So what this means is that when we turn the power on, we have to put stuff in the RAM. Okay? So if we expect things to be there at the beginning, somebody has to put them there. We have to put them there, and we'll see that um, later. Flash. Flash is a non-volatile memory type. It's generally used to store program code in constants. So your code is data, all right? It's just bits inside the processor. And we need to put it somewhere. And so we put it in Flash, which is writable. It can be written, and that's actually what we're going to exploit to do our bootloader today. But it's non-volatile, so it doesn't just up and go away when we turn the power off, which is why we use the store program code, because we want our device, and when we turn the computer off, turn it back on again, we don't want it to forget how to be a computer. You might want it to forget what it did last time we turned it on, but we don't want it to just you know, be like, oh, I'm just a, I'm just a fancy paperweight now. Um, and this is both a noun and a verb. Uh, when it's used as a noun, it's referring to the memory technology. When it's used as a verb, it means the act of programming a flash memory. Or actually, it just means programming any kind of memory. So you say, like, I flash the program onto the computer or whatever. OK. RAM, or random access memory, is a boss on memory type that is used to store variables and other program objects that change during the lifetime of the program. So this includes the stack, the heap, any global variables, any local variables, like all that stuff is all in RAM. It's going to change at runtime. So we need some data to put it somewhere that it can change. And that's the RAM. Okay, so quick quiz. I have two files. File one and file two. Um, how many do you think I'm thinking about all? Okay, so you all know what cat does, right? Okay. Which one of these files is probably a binary file, and which one is probably a text file? Anybody tell me? Yeah. First one, binary file? Yes, the left one is a binary file, and the right one is a text file. Why? Just because memory addresses go from 0 to 5 when the left one. Um, so what does that indicate to you? That each one of those characters is one byte. Yes. As so, opposed to the other one where each one is. Yeah. These are each bytes. These are also each bytes, right? Mm -hmm. What's the difference between this and that? Oh, that one's uh, it's interpreted as text. Yeah, so, so these are ASCII characters, right? right. So each of these bytes is a number that corresponds due to a standard <coughs> of ASCII to a letter. All right? And so when we cat out this file, we print out the contents of this file, we see half a beta. Right? When we cat out this file, we see a bunch of question marks, because these are symbols that the, that the shell doesn't know how to draw. It doesn't recognize these as characters. But if we put the files through hex dump, hex dump is a program that spits out the hexadecimal representation of a file we see that this file contains five bytes. Anybody know what this byte is? New line. Yeah, new line. Nice. All right, and we can see that the bytes in this file are CA, FE, BA, BE, cafe beta. But over here, it's something different. We have 43, 41, 46, 45, 42, 41, 42, 45, new line. And remember, these are in hexadecimal. So what is 43 in decimal? Sixty-seven. Yeah. And what is capital A in ASCII? Sixty-five. Yeah. So sixty-five plus two gives us sixty-seven, and that's C. So this is the ASCII value for C. That's what's different here. They both ostensibly contain cap A beta, but that one encodes it as the literal binary. This one encodes it as ASCII characters. All right. So you see the difference? All right. So yeah. This is arbitrary binary data. This is ASCII characters. So what we really mean when we make the distinction between binary and uh, text or human readable is there is some interpretation of the data inside the file that would allow a human to say, oh yeah, that is something other than just random bits. OK, so programs are data. So what do I mean by that? Like machine code, the actual code that runs on your computer is just data, all right? So what happens if we do this? Let's try. 
open a terminal, cat slash bin cat, huh, that's funny, what does that look like? There's text in here, right? Why is there text inside of my binary? So what, what's going on? Like, is, is, it, is it code? Is it text? Well, yeah, so um, these, I'm actually not sure what this specifically is, but the idea is that inside this binary, there are strings that are built into the binary. So actually, what's, what's kind of cool is, let's, let's try and get cat to, do, to, to put out an error message. So maybe we could do cat help, all right? So we see here the word equivalent, all right? So what do you think will happen if we do this? Well, it says it matches. Um, and it is a video. Ah, funky. There's equivalent inside this file. That makes sense, right? So the, the program prints it out the string equivalent, and if we search the binary we see that it contains the word equivalent. And that makes sense, because the program is actually referencing its own contents in order to show you stuff, okay? So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that program data, programs themselves, it's all interchangeable. They're all just bytes, okay? They're all stored somewhere in memory. And when you run a program and it prints stuff out, what it's doing is it's fetching contents of its own memory in order to show you those strings, okay? Right. So, what do you think would happen if we did this? Does anybody know what object dump does? You can print out the actual uh, assembly. Yeah, so it'll print out the machine code for our, for our program. So let's try that. Object dump, dash D for disassembly. Then cat, and I'll put it into less so you can scroll through it. Huh, that's funny. Where did this come from? Is it a symbol? It is a symbol, yeah. So this is a, a section. So there are debugging symbols, symbols that are used to understand how the program is structured that are inserted into this ELF file. So actually this program is in a format called ELF. It's a standard format for storing binary programs. And it's used to describe how parts of the program should be placed in the memory in order to execute it. Now what's cool is that it also has annotations in it that we can use to understand what's going on inside. So for example, we might look for a place where it jumps somewhere. Here we go, sub evx something something something. And there's an annotation here. It says that this constant, 50fc1f4e, is actually standard error plus some value, okay? So it annotated this instruction and said that this constant came from a symbol, and that symbol is this plus some offset, okay? So we can basically look at how this program is structured. We can see like, symbols here like uflow. I have no idea what this is, but it tells us, hey, this is this constant is uflow. Okay. So you notice something interesting, which is that the program contains both strings and instructions. So is it data? Is it instructions? Well, actually, it's it's both. And now there's another program we can use. Anybody ever heard of NM? So NM allows you to look at all the symbols inside of a file. So we can do nm slash uh, bin slash cat to less. Oops, oh, I didn't like that. Hmm. Well, let's do it over here instead. So I have the, the binary from four under program. So this was the main.bin. So do nm on main.l. <coughs> See, oh look. <coughs> There's all these symbols that are defined inside of my program, like data n, and vssn, int default handler, kernel stack, main, like main, this is main as in like the main function. These are all the symbols that are defined inside of the file, right? Okay, so, interesting stuff, programs are data. All right, so how can we represent this data? What, what format can we use to represent the contents of a program, like the actual instructions and all that other stuff. Do we use binary files? Well, that seems to be the approach that Elf is taking. Do we use hexadecimal? Well, we can do that. 
Like there's, a, there's actually a hex format, so we can, we can use object copy, which is another program that's part of our build tools, and we can take a program that's represented as binary or an ELF file, and we can spit it out as ASCII hex. And that might be useful if we want to like read through it and see what it looks like, because it's kind of difficult to read the, the raw binary. Could we make drawings? Well, we could. Um, probably would not be as concise as the other, the other representations. Or smoke signals? Definitely not as concise. Now, there was a question on the Facebook page about uh, doing the project with only pen and paper. And yeah, you can do it, but it would take you a really long time. All right, so more importantly, you want to know how to send this data, right? So I was able to program that guy all the way back over there without touching him, right? How did I do that? The program had to go from here to there. How did it get over there? All right, so I had to have some way of taking that program, making it into some piece of something that I could move through the air and give it to that guy so he could program himself. All right? So we'll uh, try to understand how we do that. So do we just, we just send the bytes? Like if I, so let's, let's say I have a device. It's, it's a magic tube, okay? And I put a byte in one end, and the byte pops out the other. And it's perfectly error free, okay? How do, if, let's say I'm gonna send the program, right? The program's just a string of bytes, right? I wanna send you this program. I start putting those bytes into the, into the, the magic tube, okay? How do you know when I'm done? Does any one of those bytes tell you that I'm done? No, right? Because I, I just said that the program is, is bytes, right? So the program could take any value. Any of those bytes could be another program byte. So how do I tell the person at the other end I'm done sending it? Like maybe I could say, you know, if I send five zeros in a row, it means I'm done. But what if your program has five zeros in a row inside of it? We have a problem, right? So we can't just send the bytes. We have to think of a better strategy. Do we send them all at once? What if the receiver, the guy on the other end, is not ready to take all those bytes? What if he you know, only has room to hold you know, 30 bytes, and then if you send him any more, then he'll just overflow, right? So we have to think about how many do we send at a time? What if we mess up? What if this pipe isn't perfect, and I send a byte, and it actually doesn't get there? How do I know that it didn't get there? How do I fix that, right? How do we handle state? How do I even know that that guy's ready to do anything? How do I know he's even on? He could be, you know, unplugged. You could unplug him right now, and I'd try to send data to him, and I would, you wouldn't get it, right? But I have no way of knowing that. How, or how do I know that? Like, how do we say that we want to start, stop, whatever? So these are all questions that we're going to have to answer. And we're going to do that by looking at communication systems. So this is a super fast overview of stuff from 132A. It's not going to go in depth at all. All right, it's just going to be super, super surface level. So how do we transmit data reliably? If I want to send you a message, and I want to be sure, or you know, reasonably sure that you got my message, what could I try doing? Send the message back. <coughs> sure, you can send the message back to me. So we could you know, retransmit. What else could we try? Forward error correction. All right, so nail it on the head, error correction. All right, so there are two kinds of error correction. You said one of them, you said the other. You said forward error correction. You said reverse error correction without knowing it. So forward error correction is the process of making your data redundant. So you say the same thing more than once, and the person on the other end looks at all the copies that he got and says, hmm, these don't agree with each other, but maybe there's some algorithm I can use to extract what it was that they originally wanted to say from all the times they said it. All right? And that's, that's all this about channel coding, which is really complicated. Take 132A, it'll blow your mind. All right, reverse error correction. Reverse error correction is, I got something, it doesn't look quite right, maybe I'll ask the guy to send it again. And I'll just keep doing that until I get it. And that's actually the strategy we're gonna to take today. We have CC. Okay, so what channel do we have? We have to understand what it is that we're communicating over. So in this case, we're gonna be using a UART, which is a universal asynchronous receiver transmitter. You don't have to know what that means. Just pretend like it's that pipe that I was talking about, right? It's a perfect tube. I send something in one end, it comes out the other. I don't really care how that happened. It just happens, all right? It's not perfect. It's well behaved, but it's not perfect, okay? And so we can't assume that it's gonna be 100% accurate, but we can assume that it's reasonably accurate. <coughs> and then how do we signal about control across the channel? So, um, we have this concept of a symbol, something that mean has to, uh, represents some information, okay? So 
Um, some symbols, some of our, our alphabet of things that we can say over the channel will have to be allocated to control, and some will have to be allocated to data. So if one character is one byte, but we're using some of those bytes as control, how do we send all possible bytes, right? Because our file can still contain every possible byte. So how do we send it? And it is literally anything. Sure, you can send multiple bytes at the same byte, right? So you want to send 255. What might you send instead? Um, or let's say you want to send five. You send one or four, I guess. That's sure. So you could you could take some subset of your symbols that can't can't, can't represent everything from zero to five. Maybe they can only represent zero to three, but two of them added together can represent everything from zero to five, right? So now we've cut our our symbol space. We've we've taken some subset of our symbols and said these will mean this. And the rest of the symbols are now free to use for something else, right? That's the strategy we're going to take. What kinds of control do we want? So we have a bootloader, right? So what kinds of things do we want the bootloader to be able to do? Any ideas? Sure. So we want the bootloader to be able to put the program that we gave it into memory, right? And then, when we're all done, what do we want the bootloader to do? Uh, Run the program, right? So we need some way to tell the bootloader, I have a program for you, here it is. I'm done giving you the program that I have for you. Run the program. So you have to know the first term. So I have to be able to do start and stop. What else do we need to do? We need to be able to say, uh, that thing that I gave you that you sent back to me doesn't look quite right, right? So we call that ACK and NACK. ACK is acknowledge, meaning that it's positive. So like it gave me back something, and I said, yeah, it looks like what I sent you. We're all good. Good job. Or if we get back something that looks wrong, and we're like, no, 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 this is all wrong. Let me send it to you again. Mm -hmm. We'll just call that a knack. Okay. So we have these different, these different things that we want to be able to control. Okay. So let's build our scheme. So our scheme consists of first writing to the device. So how are we going to write to the device? Let's pick a character to mean start. Let's just pick S. S for start. Okay. So we'll call the start sentinel for when we're transmitting to the device, capital S. So if we write capital S over this magic pipe, the guy on the other end is like, oh, okay, I'm ready to receive. Then we're going to send our data, and we're going to encode it as ASCII hexadecimal. So for every byte that we want to send, we're going to send two characters, one for the upper four bits and one for the lower four bits. Does that make sense? Right? Because we have 16 possible, uh, 16 possible hexadecimal characters. Two to the four, four possible four bits, total of 16 combinations. So we have four bits in the high side and four bits in the low side. We'll call those nibbles, that's what we call them. Um, so the first four octets of the message we're going to send is going to be the address. It's going to be the location of memory where we want to put this block of data that we're sending. Okay? Because we're assembling a program, right? And our program might be longer than our block. We need to send more than one block. Because remember, our device can't take all the data at once, right? It has a buffer we need to put it into. That buffer is a fixed size. So we can only send so much data at a time. So we're going to say that's 1,024 bytes. There's actually a reason for that. Um, we'll talk about that later. But it's 1,024 bytes in size. So we can only send 1,024 program bytes at a time, which means we need some way of saying the order, right? We need some way of saying that this block belongs here. And the way we do that is that the first four octets, the first four bytes we send, which is the first how many characters? Four bytes, how many characters do we need to send four bytes? Eight. Eight, yeah, right? Okay, so we're sending eight characters, eight characters for four octets, and that's gonna be the address where we're gonna put this block. And then we're gonna send how many characters for 1,024 bytes? 2048, right? So twice as many characters as you have bytes. We're sending one kilobyte, so we're sending two kilobytes of characters, all right? Okay, so. We've sent our data, all right? So what do, we, what do we need to do next? We said start, we sent our data, now what? Back in that. For that, no, oh, please. Stop, right, yeah. So we're gonna say done. And we'll call that the terminator. And we'll, we'll use T. So why didn't we use E for end? Any ideas? Because that's the end of the entire we're, we're making this up as we go along, right? 
We can use whatever we want, but why why are we not using E? It's in the first characters. They're not reserved. Wait, when you said S and T, are they like ASCII characters? Yes. I'm saying the actual letter S and the actual letter T, the ASCII characters. So e is the most common. Because hmm? E is the most common letter. Uh, no. So remember, we're sending hexadecimal, right? What is the hexadecimal alphabet? Oh, E is a uh, fifth. fifth. Yeah, E is an hexadecimal, right? So we can't use E because we already used E for this, right? So we can't use E. So we need to use something else. And I actually made this mistake when I was in Lydia. First, I used E for N, and then I wasn't working. I was like, why is it not working? And then I looked at it and I saw it. Yeah, okay. So anyway, <laughs> so we can't use E, all right? So we use T. It's totally arbitrary. We just can't use what we've used so far. So what is our alphabet so far? What letters have we used? A, B, C, D, E, S, T. And what else? Zero through nine. Yeah, zero through nine. So so far we've used zero through nine, A through F, S and T. All right. Okay. So we said start. We sent our data. We said terminate. And now the guy on the other end needs to tell us whether it looks good or not. Right? He needs to either acknowledge or not acknowledge. So we need two more letters. So what might those be? Oh, well, we already used S, right? Uh, Q and R. Sure. I actually picked uh, K for ACK and X for NAC. So K is in like OK and X is in like nope. So, um, so yeah. But it's totally arbitrary. Again, as long as I haven't used so far, we can use it. I just happen to pick K and X. OK. So that was our entire write procedure, right? We sent a block of data. The guy on the other end says, looks good or looks bad. And then we can decide what to do from there. Assuming that he says it looks good, now he's going to send the data back to us so we can double check it, right? So what does that process look like? Any ideas? Yeah, it basically looks the same. It's in reverse. Now, um, for totally arbitrary reasons, I decided to switch to lowercase for the, for the receiving direction. And that's just not entirely arbitrary. The reason for that is so that I can distinguish between the packets when I'm looking at all the traffic in one window. So if I'm seeing what's going in both directions, I'm able to distinguish between who's saying, you know, good start and whatever. So um, after the block is written, we echo the data back, and we start with lowercase s. We send our block same way we did before. We then send our terminator, lowercase t, and now the host says either acknowledge or not acknowledge, and it's going to use lowercase k or lowercase x. Yeah. Uh, why can we send 240 characters? Hmm? Why can we send 248 characters? Mm, 2048? Where are you getting 248? Yeah. 2048. Oh, okay. So this has to do with the size of the flash blocks in the device. So the flash memory in the device is divided up into blocks, and each block is individually erasable. So when you when you program the flash, you can't actually just write wherever you want. The way that it works is you clear a flash block by erasing it, and it sets all of the bits in that flash block to one, and then you write your data into it through a special register procedure, and that basically flips the appropriate bits to zero. So you actually, the only way to flip a flash bit from zero to one is to clear it, which is a very expensive operation, and on top of that, it actually degrades the flash. So you can only do this so many times. It's like 100,000 writes before it burns out. So, um, so basically, 1,024 is our block size because that's the size of a flash block. So we're basically writing a whole block flash every time we send this block. Okay, that's what we chose. That, that's what we chose. And if we chose 512, we'd be in trouble because um, we would have to clear that flash page, the whole flash page, which is 1,024 bytes, and then we would write 512 bytes into it. And now we have to write the other 512, and we have to keep track of the fact that we. You know, already cleared it, so we don't want to clear it again. And so if we clear it again, then we just erase the stuff we wrote last time. So it's just convenient, you know, in terms of the, the work that you have to do as an implementer to make things line up like this. Right? Wait, but you get can you get 2048 characters? Oh, okay. So so we need to be able to send a byte, right? Yeah. How many possible values can a byte take? Uh, 256. Right. 256 possible values. Um, how many possible values can a hexadecimal digit take? Uh, 16. 
So how many hexadecimal digits does it take to represent one byte? Two. And if we're using ASCII to encode our hexadecimal digits, how much data does it take to encode each hexadecimal digit? Uh, one byte. One byte. So how many bytes per byte of data? Two, right? One byte for the first digit, one byte for the second digit. <coughs> so, so the thing we're trying to do is, like, we have some simple space. In here is like A, B, C, D, E, blah, 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 right? If we used all of them, let's suppose there are 256 of these, or rather the Call this S. The cardinal of the size of S is 256. And we want to send bytes. Each byte can take 256 possible values, right? Then we're using every one of our symbols to represent every one of our possible unique bytes, right? Which means that we can't do this, right? We can't say that S means start and T means stop and so on, right? Because S and T are already being used to represent one of our possible 256 bytes, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to partition this space. And we're going to say all of these guys are used to mean the data. And all of these guys are used to mean the control. Well, okay. So what we're doing is we're separating out S, T, lowercase s, lowercase t, um, capital K, capital X, lowercase k, lowercase x. So all of those guys are in the control set. So S, T. X, S, T, K, X, right? And then the rest of these guys are reserved for doing control, are reserved for sending data. But we're, we're choosing to use hexadecimal because it's convenient, it's easy to you know, look at and understand what it, what, what it says. So for data, we're only going to use 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. Follow? Yep. Okay. So we've now, we've now partitioned our symbol space. We have 256 possible symbols, but we're going to use these symbols to mean data and these symbols to mean control. And now it is completely unambiguous when I send an S. I know that I mean start. If I send an A, I know that it means a hexadecimal digit that's part of my data. Okay? So that, that's how we're basically distinguishing between when we're sending data and when we're sending control. Follow? OK. So because each one of these is an ASCII character when we write it over the line, each one of these takes one byte, right? And it takes two of these to represent every byte of data. So it takes two bytes on the line to represent one byte of data. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So then shouldn't there only be 512 uh, characters per block? No. So, so our blocks are 1,024 data bytes, right? Oh, data bytes? Not. Yeah. This not is 1,024 bytes. data bytes. So our, our flash block, the actual program, we want to put 1,024 bytes of program into the memory of the device. Oh, so it's not actually 1,024 bytes. It's actually data bytes. Yeah, it's data bytes. So we, we want to send 10, or 1,024 bytes worth of the program to the device. In order to send 1,024 bytes of the program to the device, we need to send 2,048 bytes of that. Okay. Right? Follow? Yeah. Right. Is that clear? So does it translate it before putting it into the flash? Yes. Yeah. So it has to translate it, which is what our bootloader does. Our, a portion of our bootloader is a state machine that understands this scheme that we've set up. And it's going to take those characters that's receiving on the line, and it's going to put them into memory. Does that make sense? Any other questions? OK. And then, of course, we're going to repeat this process as many times as necessary to send our entire program. And what if our program is not a multiple of 1,024 bytes? What do we do? Any ideas? Yeah, we've got it. <coughs> totally doesn't matter. But yeah, we, we can pick zero. Um, but the idea is that our program is only going to reference stuff that's part of it, right? So if we send extra bytes, the program's not going to reference those, right? So we can send whatever we want. We could fill it with cafe, maybe. But it doesn't really matter. OK. So our total symbol alphabet is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. Lowercase A, B, C, D, E, F, because um, we designed our, uh, in the case of the implementation that I'm giving you guys. Um, I designed it so that it can accept both uppercase and lowercase letters for the, for the hexadecimal. 
and then uh, SDKX and SDKs. Right? So we're not quite done yet. We need one more thing. So we, we've been able to send our data, we've been able to verify our data, but we had one more thing we wanted our builder to be able to do. What is that? Run it, right? So we need one more character that we're going to use to indicate to the bootloader that we're done and that we want to run the program. And pick a character. R. Why R? OK. That would have been maybe a better choice. I picked Q for quit. Um, so yeah, <laughs> finish sentence all is Q. And now our alphabet is now then. Right? Cool. Any questions about that? All right. So, memory model. So we have flash, and it's located at address zero, and it's of length 40,000 hex, which is 256 kilobytes. So in our device, if we access address zero, we're referring to the lowest address in the flash. If we access address 40,000 hex, we're actually accessing outside the bounds of the flash. We'd have to subtract four in order to access the, the last program word before the end. Um, but that's 256 kilobytes. And then we have our SRAM, that's static random access memory. And that's located at address uh, 2,000 or 20 million hex and is of length uh, 8,000 hex, which is 32 kilobytes. We're going to divide our flash into what are called regions. Um, and we're going to call them the bootloader code region, which is beginning at address 0 and going to 1,000 hex, which is 4 kilobytes. And then we're going to have the other part, which is the target program code region, which starts at 1,000 hex and is of length uh, 3F000. Right? So this is the remaining length in that region. So 252 kilobytes is available to use for our target program. 4 kilobytes is reserved for the code that constitutes the bootloader. Right? Yeah? This is just like how it's set up. This is totally arbitrary. I, I designed this. Um, you can pick it any way you want. The idea is that. Um, this um, bootloader code region should be where the device is going to run the code first. So it's convenient to place it into the zeroth address because that's where it that's where it first loads the program. But potentially, you could have a little stub at the beginning that just relocates the program execution to somewhere else, and then have your bootloader locate somewhere else. But I chose to do it this way. And um, how do you think I arrived at four kilobytes? Any ideas? Why don't I choose one kilobyte? Yeah. Because your bootloader won't fit in one kilobyte? Probably not, yeah. So my bootloader actually, when I compiled it, it came out to about three and a half kilobytes. So I chose the next highest multiple of 1024, which is 4K. All right. OK. In each of these regions, there are several sections, OK? And I'm building this up to linker scripts. So these words are important, but we have first the dot .isr vector section, OK? This section contains the interrupt vector table. So remember that table that we used to look up our interrupt uh, vectors? That table is located in the flash, and the section is called dot .isr vector, OK? And that is aligned with the very beginning of that region. So at the very beginning of this region at address 0 is the first vector in the ISR vector table. Now, actually, the first vector is the initial stack pointer, but um, we'll understand that in a bit. Next is vtable. Dot vtable is located in RAM. And this is actually sort of a constructed thing. It has to do with the uh, TiVoWare library that Texas Instruments builds for these devices. Um, there's a mechanism for registering interrupt handlers at runtime. So if you want to be able to say, you know, go to this function when you have this interrupt occur, at runtime, you need some way of modifying the vector table, right? But the vector table is located in Flash. So we can't exactly modify it. We can, but if every time we boot our device, we modify the vector table, we're going to burn out the Flash really fast, right? So what happens is we allocate some space in RAM, which is large enough to hold the vector table, right? And if we ever do a runtime vector allocation, then the vector table gets copied out of Flash into RAM. We modify it to add that new vector. And then we update the pointer that's part of hardware that says where this vector table is located so that it points to it in RAM as opposed to the flash. Okay. Then we have the text section. The text section is in flash. 
And the text section contains your program's code. So this contains all of your functions, all of your you know, loops, and whatever other garbage code you write on. Just kidding. Uh, OK, next is the row data, read-only data. These are all your constants, OK? So if you ever do like const int blah blah equals 20, somewhere in row data there's a value 20. And whenever you refer to blah blah, you're referring to this thing. Then we have data. Data is your variables that get initialized at program start. So if you do int foo equals 5, notice the difference between const int foo is 5 and int foo is 5. If it's const int foo, it can go into row data, which is if it's int foo equals 5, it can be modified at runtime, and so it has to go into RAM, right? So that would go into data because we gave it an initializer. We said it's equal to 5 and start the program, right? And this is important. Um, uh, the initial values are located in, in flash for this, okay? So basically, we have two places that data goes. In flash are all the initial values for the data. In RAM, there's empty space to hold them, okay? So when you refer to these values, you're referring to them in RAM. But when the program first starts up, we have to copy the values from the place in Flash where the initializers are stored into RAM to set their values. Okay? And that's part of the C runtime. It, the initialization procedure copies these initializers from Flash into RAM. Then we have .arm.exidx and .arm.extab. These are annotations for doing stack unwinding. So basically, if you've ever done, if you ever used DDD and you've done like BT for backtrace, and you want to like see how the function calls are nested. In order to do that on ARM, there's a special memory region that has to be allocated, which stores annotations for this, for this process. It basically says like which, which function is, is expected to call with other function and so on. And this information is used when the debugger goes to unroll that, that stack trace. Then we have the BSS. The BSS stores variables that are uninitialized when the program starts. Okay? These are in RAM. And the BSS is zero filled at start. So with the data section, we copy the initializers from Flash into RAM. With the BSS, we just go over the whole region, write it all zero. Okay? So if you, if you declare a variable that doesn't have an initial value, this is what's going to happen. It's going to go in BSS, and it's going to be zero initialized, hopefully. It's not always guaranteed it's going to be zero initialized. And you might have seen this in 33. You might have written a program where you declare uh, an undefined variable, and then you, you know, print it out or whatever. You see that it changes sometimes. Like, so, but in the, case of our, in the case of our system, they're initialized to zero. Next, we have the heap. The heap is where malloc, free, new, and delete play. And it's in RAM, of course. We have the stack. So this is where your, your call stack is. When you call functions, you're allocating stack frames to store your local variables and stuff like that. That's all in RAM. It's in the stack section. And that's it for, for the memory model. So any questions about this stuff? Yeah. So you said that like Flash is easily degradable. Yeah. So what's why would we want to ever put stuff in Flash and it's like easily changeable? Like, it's like easily changeable. Just put everything into like RAM. <coughs> Remember, RAM is volatile, right? Yeah. So when I turn my device on, the RAM contents are unknown. We need some way of having our program persist when we turn the device off and turn it back on, right? So that's why we use Flash. Flash is non-volatile, so we can put things in it. We can program Flash, and then when we turn the device off and turn it back on, that stuff is still there, All right? That's why we use Flash. Now, there are other forms of, of non-volatile storage. Like, you could have a disk, right, a magnetic disk. Or you could have uh, a magnetic tape or a CD or something like that, right? But, of course, like, you're probably not going to have a disk drive on an embedded processor, right? Like, if you're putting this inside of a, you know, a little, like, quadcopter or whatever, you know, <laughs> hopefully you're not planning on installing a disk drive in your quadcopter. But, yeah. So, so Flash is, is very high density, it's very low power, um, it just has this, un this inconvenient side effect, or this inconvenient property that it degrades when you write to it. And your SSDs, those, those really fast drives in your computers now, those are Flash. They have a lifespan. You write them a certain number of times and they break. All right? But what's cool about them is that when you buy an SSD, you're actually buying more capacity than is listed on the disk. And there's a piece of uh, hardware inside of there which does wear leveling. It basically says, when I put a file on that disk, it's going to say, you know, last time I wrote this file on the disk, I put it here. But that, that's gotten a lot, of, a lot of access recently. So let's not write it there. Let's go write it over here where we haven't touched before. And it's going to try and you know, spread out the, the, the wear on the disk. And if the algorithm is good, then you're going to get you know, the total lifetime of the disk out of it, as opposed to partial lifetime, because you're going to burn out whatever dies fastest, right? So 
So, yeah, so in our case, you know, a feature that we can add to the bootloader is wire leveling, right? We can say, if I write a new program to it, I'm always writing at the same place. Like the, the bootloader, the host bootloader sends the address it wants to write that block to, right? So if I write it a certain number of times, I'm going to burn it out. But there are all these blocks I wasn't using, right? There's 236k of flash, and I'm only using like you know 2k for my program or whatever, right? So we can think of ways to implement wear leveling in our bootloader, and our bootloader can say when it gets a program and says, you know, I put this over here last time, but that, that part has been getting a lot of use. Let's go put it over here so it doesn't burn out my flash as fast. Okay? Yeah. So would you have to store um, values like saying how many times you've used each block elsewhere? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of tricky, right? Because uh, in order to keep track of what you've done to your disk, you have to use your disk, right? Yeah. Which means there's a table somewhere on your flash drive which is used to store the modifications to the flash drive, and you're modifying that table, which means that that is now going to be the hottest place in your disk, right? So you move the table too. So you have to move the table too. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And Edgar had a lot of fun describing this to us in 111. Um, but, but, yeah. Uh, basically, yeah, you have a table that is used to store keep track of these changes, and that table has to move around too, because the table itself is a hot spot. If you break the table, you're going to wear that out. So yeah, fun stuff. Okay, let's do a recap, and we're we're burning time. So let's so, so. All right, ARM core registers. All we really care right now are these two, SP and PC. So raise your hand if you know what a program counter is. All right, raise your hand if you know what a stack pointer is. All right, a stack pointer points to the top of your stack. So you know what a pointer is, right? Yeah. So a pointer is just a number that refers to some location memory, right? So when you call a function, you get stuff like this. Like I'm calling a function, uh, I have a function f which calls a function g, right? So when I call the function f, let's say it has a local variable foo. Where does foo go? Foo goes on the stack. So this is the activation record of f. It's the location in the stack you think of like a stack of books, a bunch of like memory cells we're inserting things into, and it grows in one direction. So we're gonna put a book onto that stack, which is called foo. And the section of the stack where we put that book is called the activation record of f. Now f calls a function g, right? And we're gonna return from g eventually, right? So when we call g, we don't wanna blow away what we say. We don't wanna blow away foo, right? So when we return from g, f still needs to be able to access foo. So we stack the activation records. F calls G, so G's stack frame, this, this activation record, goes on top of the activation record for F. Okay? And then we need some way to refer to where we were previously, so we use what's called a frame pointer, which is stored on the stack, and that refers to the last place that we were. And then what we do is when G returns, we pop G's stack frame, and then we pop the previous frame pointer, and now our stack pointer returns where we were. Yes. It, no, actually, it's a it's a linked list. It's a linked list of activation records, and it's singly linked. Now, you can also have doubly linked activation records. Those are used in languages like Lisp, where you can have like continuations and other funky voodoo going on. But but yeah. So in, in C, we have a singly linked list, which is our activation records, our stack frames. Those are on the stack. Okay. But what's important here is that when we start our program, we have some location memory that's allocated for our stack. Remember, back over here. We have a section, stack, okay? And when we start the program, we need to move the stack pointer so that it points to the top of this stack region. Because in ARM, our stack is descending, it goes down, okay? So we put the stack pointer at the top of the stack, and as we use, as we use more stack space, as our program executes, the stack is gonna grow down, and so it's gonna grow into the stack space. So we need, we need to move that stack pointer to the correct location, and when we load our program and run it, we need to do the same thing for that program, right? Because our, our bootloader, like, its, its stack pointer is managed for it by the C runtime, right? But the bootloader is going to go and run another program. And when it goes to run that other program, it has to do all the stuff that was done for it by the C runtime to that program. And namely, that's moving the stack pointer and the program counter. Because we need to also, also execute that code, right? So the program counter needs to move to the code for that new program, right? Okay. So we only really care about these two guys. Um, a stack, we have three operations, push, top, and pop. Pop is the top element, we generally don't like the rest of the elements. But inside of a, a, a frame, a stack frame is a little more complicated because we have local variables we're referring to multiple locations in the stack. But yeah, it's a stack. Call stack, 
the specialization of the stack. All right. Do a quick example. This same thing from context switching. So we have some C program code. Int main declares foo. Then it sets foo to two. Then it returns foo. How does this look in ARM? Compile it. We get this. These are the instructions that correspond to that function. Let's execute them. What does it do? Well, first we're going to say what, what these are. So this is the memory address that corresponds to uh, that instruction. So these are instructions in memory. These are the addresses where the, those, those uh, instructions are. These are the values in memory. So this is the actual um, opcode and then operands in, in hexadecimal. And this is the interpretation that object dump gives us. Okay? This is the value interpreted as a, our instruction. That's the opcode. And then we have the operands over here. Okay? With the arguments to our little functions. We execute it. Our PC starts here. Our program counter starts at the top. We push FP. So FP is currently off here somewhere because we're thinking of stack frames, right? So we had a previous function which called main. Somebody has to call main, all right? And that's part of the C runtime. So our, fra our frame pointer is up here somewhere. So the first thing we do is we push FP. So the old FP goes here and our stack pointer moves down, all right? Then we uh, add SP, SP12. What does that do? Or sorry, uh, add FP, SP0. So this is the destination. This is the source. This is the value to add to the source. So SP plus zero is SP. So the FP moves from wherever it was before down to SP, all right? Then we say sub SP, SP12. We're allocating three system words, a total of 12 bytes. Our system words are four bytes because we're a 32-bit architecture. We allocate three words worth of space on the stack. So our SP moved down three slots. Then we store uh, the value one, or rather we move the value one into the register R3. So R3 now contains one. We're setting up for this, okay? We haven't done this yet, but we're getting this constant ready in a register. Next, we store that register into this location in the stack, okay? So this is foo here in the stack, one. Next, we're gonna move two into R3. So we're getting ready to do this, we're getting this constant in a, in a, in a register. Then we store R3 into the location, now it holds two, foo is now two. Finally, we're gonna return in the arm calling convention, the way that we return a value is we put it in R0, and when we return from our function, whoever is calling us looks at R0, and that's, that's a return value. So we're gonna put it in R0, so in order to do that, we have to first take it out of the stack. So we load from the stack, F U minus eight, into R3, R3 gets two. We move R3 into R0 to set up for our return. Finally, we subtract FP0 into SP. So SP becomes FP, so we're basically deallocating the space we allocated. Finally, we pop our frame pointer, so it goes back to wherever it was before. So remember, our frame pointer was pointing at old FP, so when we pop FP, we're saying take whatever was at FP and put it into FP. So we're going up there. And that, or sorry, that was, uh, so SP was here, my bad. So, so pop says take whatever's at SP and put it into FP. Uh, so FP gets old FP, goes up there, <coughs> like that. Finally, we PXLR, so this is branch uh, branch unconditional to link register, um, and the link register is a special register in the ARM uh, in the ARM calling convention, which basically stores the return address for a function call. And so we're basically going back to where we came from, and we're all done. Okay. Uh, so here are some useful uh, instructions you'll need when you're implementing uh, your code. Um, you get these slides at the end. There's a link. Um, okay. So. Program startup procedure, I mentioned this before. What we do is we need to load the stack pointer from the zeroth entry of the interrupt vector table. So the interrupt vector table contains a bunch of entries. The zeroth entry is the initial value of our stack pointer, okay? So the first thing we have to do when we're gonna boot our new program that we just programmed in the flash is we have to load SP from that, from that location, okay? And conveniently, we have a symbol that refers to the beginning of the program flash, okay? So remember, we, we decided we're gonna split our flash into two regions. One region for the bootloader, one region for the target program. And in the linker script, which we haven't seen yet, we define this symbol, which refers to the beginning of that program section, okay? And remember, our interrupt vector table is at the beginning of our program section, right? So the zeroth address, the zeroth location of our vector table is at 
program text start, which is this symbol. So we're going to load SP from program text start. Right? Then we're going to load our PC from the first entry in the network table. Because the first entry in our vector table is the reset interrupt server routine. It's the, the server routine for when our device resets. So we load PC from there. Then we begin executing reset ISR. Whatever code happens to be pointed at by that, and we're good to go. That's our program. Right? So we need to write some assembly to do this, and we're going to perform these, these above steps manually. And the program is not going to know the difference, right? Because the program is expecting the C runtime to do this for it, right? It expects that the, the C runtime is going to is going to execute these bits for it. Um, sorry, not the C runtime. The, the hardware is going to do it because normally the hardware is what does this initially. It, it loads these values from from memory, but now we need to do it for it because it's no longer located at the zeroth address. It's not the first thing that runs, so we need to do it for it. And we do it like this. I'm going to try some somebody to do that. All right. So any questions about this? I'm starting to go a little bit faster than I should you guys time to work on <laughs> So, any questions? No? Okay. Alright, so linear scripts. So we've looked at how all these pieces sort of fit together, right? But we need some way of telling the compiler and the linker and, and all these other guys that are involved in moving our data from one end to the other, where to actually put these things, okay? And we do that by modifying our linker script. Okay, and our linker script is the little bit of code that we write that says where all these things go, okay? Remember we said that our, our, our uh, flash is divided into two regions and they begin at this address and are this long? Those values we're actually going to put into our linker script and it's going to tell the linker this is what you need to do, all right? So those sections and regions we're talking about, they're made explicit in a special file and we call it the linker script. We define the start and the length of regions. We then define aliases for those regions. So if we want to refer to them by different names, we can do that. Then we define the symbols that refer to addresses in the memory map. So that this symbol back here, like this prog text start, prog text start plus four, like these, these underscore underscore things, we need to make these. And we define those in the language script. And then we specify where to place the objects exported by the compiler. So the compiler is going to generate code, like functions and stuff like that in the object file. And we say where we want those things to go. And that's done with the script. So here's an example of the script. This is actually an excerpt from the script that is used to build the bootloader for that guy. So here, we define our two regions, our boot flash and our prog flash. They're both read execute, right? The origin for our boot flash is at zero. The length of our boot flash is 1,000 hex. <coughs> The origin for our prog flash is 1000 hex, and its length is 3f000. Then we have our SRAM, the static RAM. The origin for that number is two seven zeros, and the length is 8000 hex, 32k. All right? Then we're going to find some aliases. So we're going to say, I want to use the name region boot text to refer to boot flash. That's totally arbitrary. And it's mainly just I can do this. Like, I can make this nice and you know clean to read. I'm going to take the ISR vector, the, the vector table, and I'm going to put it into region boot text. That's what this little arrow means. It means stick it in there. All right? And we also alias prog flash as region prog text. We alias SRAM as region VSS. So we have regions for all of our little sections we define, where we have the VSS section, the data section, blah, blah, blah. So we define aliases for each of them so they're nice, like, nice parity between the names we use and what they refer to. But this is totally unnecessary. We could, we could totally just use SRAM where we're going to use this. We could use prog flash um, and root flash, use root flash here. But you know, it's convenient to have a different name for it if we want it. OK, so the, the interesting thing is we have provisions in our sections definition. So sections defines all the sections that we have. So that like dot .isr vector, dot .data, dot .row data, blah, blah, blah. We can use provide statements to say that a certain symbol has a certain value. So this symbol becomes part of our object file, and it can be used in our C code and in our assembly. And that's how we're going to know where to put things. We're going to use this symbol in our C code to know where to stick stuff in our bootloader. Okay? And we define it here, and we say that it's this. And then we say that prog text end is this. All right? That makes sense, right? Prog text end is referring to the end of our program flash. It's of this length, and it's at this position, so this plus this is that. Right? Okay. 
then we say that our the base address for our interrupt vectors is at zero. So our bootloader is in the very first four pages, first four blocks of our flash. So its interrupt vector table is at zero. The program's vector table, the target program's vector table is where? Right, 1000x. Because our program flash starts here and we know that the vector table is the beginning. So our, our target program's vector table is at 1000x, but our bootloader's vector table is at zero. Okay, so we say that ours is at zero. So we have actually two linker scripts. This linker script is for our bootloader. We have another one that's for our program. I've already compiled the programs for you. I have one for blinking the green LED, one for blinking the blue LED, and one for blinking the red LED. But all the code is in the GitHub repository that you guys saw. So if you're interested, you can get a hold of that and modify it, write your own programs to load. But um, the reason why we need to do that is because when we build our other program, we need to tell the compiler and the linker and all the other guys that we want all of our code to go at this offset and not this offset, right? Make sense? Now, there's another interesting thing about linker scripts. There's this dot thing. This dot means the current pointer, okay? So it starts at zero. It starts at the beginning of whatever your memory region is. And every time you insert stuff into a region, this guy gets moved to the end of that region. So however, however large the interrupt vector table is, when we finish doing this, this dot will refer to the end of that vector table, okay? And we use that dot to indicate the end. So at the beginning, before we do keep ISR vector, before we insert the vector table into this section, we say text start is equal to dot. So text start is gonna be zero. Then we insert a vector table into this section and dot will be now pointing at the end of the vector table. And we can use that to, to determine how long it is. So we can then you know, bind another symbol, maybe vector table end or whatever. And if we do vector table end minus text start, we'll know how long the vector table is. Okay. So any questions about this stuff? All right. And uh, yeah, don't, don't worry, this is confusing. This took me a very long time to understand. I'm trying to like distill it down so you guys can like very quickly consume it. But yeah, if, if, it's, if it's making your head hurt a little bit, it's totally understandable. All right, so like we said, flash is divided into 1024 byte blocks. They're individually erasable. So if we want to program it, we have to first erase the block, which sets all the bits to one, and then we write the bits that need to be clear as appropriate, okay? The write procedure is defined in this section of the data sheet. There's a bunch of registers we have to twiddle in order to make it happen, but because we already did the registers workshop at the beginning of the, uh, beginning of the year, we've already done our due diligence, so we can just use the functions that are defined for us in the library to do it. So we have two functions we're gonna use, flash erase, we pass it an address, which is the beginning of the block we want to erase, and we'll do it for us. And then we have flash program. We pass it a buffer, we say where we want that buffer to go, and we say how long it is, and it'll just magically write it, okay? <laughs> now, there are some conditions here. Um, things have to be of the right size and so on, but yeah. Okay, that's basically it. Our total procedure is now. Device resets. We're now in our bootloader, okay? Our bootloader is going to wait for the host program, that, that, that bootload.py script, to attach to it. And the way it does that is it's going to send um, bootloader start or whatever I made the string that it sends, and then it'll go dot dot, dot, and it'll do that five times. And if it times out, if it hits five seconds, it prints one dot per second. If it prints out five dots and nobody says anything, then it'll just go and run the program, right? But if in that five second window, somebody attaches to it, you know, the bootloader host program says, wait, start, like sends a, a, an S or whatever, then it knows, okay, I have somebody's trying to talk to me, I wanna get ready to load the program, right? So assuming the host attaches, we now have the host send the program one block at a time. Every block it verifies the contents. If the contents are bad, you know, the device says NAC, and we send it again, assuming that it acts, and we move on to the next block. We do that until we're done with all blocks. Then once we're all done with that, we set the whole program, we terminate with Q, and that triggers the bootloader to start the target application. Otherwise, the bootloader host does not attach, meaning that nobody is there on the other end of the line waiting for us to say, I'm ready to receive the program. We time out. And then we start with the program. All right? So, any questions about that? Yeah, so you send like a block of the program from your computer there, mm -hmm. and that acknowledges? Yes. How will it know? Like, let's say, does it know it's good or bad? How does it figure it out? So, it doesn't know that the contents are good or bad. Mm -hmm. 
All it knows is that what it got was not invalid in our alphabet. Uh, okay. okay. And then what it's going to do is it's going to send that block back to us, mm -hmm. right? So now it's our responsibility to say whether the thing that we got back from it is the same thing that we sent, okay. right? So if we say that what we got back is not what we sent, then it's not going to write anything, okay? Because it, it writes the flash at the end. So assuming that all that went correctly and it sends back what we sent it, then we have a reasonably good, um, a reasonably good uh, indication that what we sent was valid, and then we can acknowledge it, and then it'll write it into the flash. Right. Any other questions? All right, great. So let's get cracking. So we have two things we need to implement: program block write and run target program. This requires a little bit of assembly. This doesn't. This one's really easy. Like it should take you, you know, maybe like ten minutes to do this one. This might be a little bit longer, but I can come around and help you. Um, so we have about half an hour to do this, um, and this presentation is located here. Thanks for coming, guys. That's it. That's in the presentation.